Christopher Brown, and I will be your moderator for tonight. In the spirit of truth and reconciliation, we acknowledge that we are broadcasting live from Calgary, Alberta, the home of the traditional territories of the Treaty 7 people and the Métis Nations of Alberta Region and the Métis Nations of Alberta Region 3 and all the people who make up their homes across Turtle Island. Tonight's debate will focus on six issues that were picked from over 323. We had one submitted about two minutes before we went live. That's how much interest was involved in this debate. They were submitted at the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown's website. With submissions from across this great country, I narrowed the questions down to six. The candidates were not given any prior knowledge of the questions, but were given the topics 48 hours prior to tonight's debate. The topics of tonight's debate are climate change, foreign policy, China and Russia. Topic three will be future of the Green Party of Canada. Topic four, affordable housing and the houselessness population. Topic five, infrastructure. And topic six, and the last topic of tonight's debate, will be immigration and refugees. Prior to us going live, the candidates all agreed on the debate rules. I will once again set them out for everyone watching and listening to tonight's debate. Each candidate will have a one-minute opening statement. This will go in alphabetical order by last name. Once the final candidate has concluded with their opening statement, we will move on to the question and answer segment of the debate. A question will be posed to the first candidate and they will have one minute to respond to that question. Each candidate, again, going in alphabetical order, will have one minute to respond to the question. This will continue until we have finished all six questions. During the question and answer segment, though, if a candidate wishes to, once all candidates have had their chance to respond to the question, they will be allowed a 30-second follow-up. Each candidate will be given three opportunities to follow up. After the three follow-ups are done, they will not be given any other opportunity to follow up on the question, but just answer the question in the one minute. Once the question and answer segment is completed, we will move on to the two-minute closing statements. This time, it will be in reverse alphabetical order. Then I will close with a final response. So let the official part of this campaign debate begin. I'd like to welcome to the debate in alphabetical order by last names, but I'm just going to use their first names just for time. Sarah, Simon, Anna, Elizabeth, Jonathan, and Chad. Thank you all for participating into tonight's debate. Now we will begin with opening statements. And they will begin, once I find my timer, which is right there, with Sarah. Sarah, you have one minute whenever you're ready. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I've been a Green since 2005, but I've been deeply devoted to Green political philosophy since 1991. I know this party inside and out. I know what works and what doesn't work. And I know certain experiments that we haven't tried yet. And as leader, it's my job to do two things to enhance your experience as a Green, as a member, and to give you confidence. And confidence not just in me, that I've got this, but that we've got this as a collective and highlighting the things that we do as a collective. I'm a high school teacher. I, my degree is in politics and Indigenous studies. I teach in Northern Ontario, Anishinaabek First Nation territory, which is comprised of the Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi First Nations. And I'm so happy to be here tonight, Chris. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you, Sarah. Again, <laughs> Simon. One minute to yourself Thank whenever you. you're ready. Thank you, Chris. I believe that human beings are not here to tame nature, but to live with nature in a sustainable global ecosystem. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have learned to subordinate nature to unbridled economic growth that will cripple the global system, ecosystem, and threaten the sustainability of humanity on this planet. Our future depends on harmonizing our way of life with the natural world. That is why I joined the Green Party. That is why I'm being involved in politics for the last 20 years. Uh, first by studying political science and after uh, by doing like provincial, uh, municipal, 
and also school board uh, politics. So uh, I think I'm ready for that job. I think the position of leader is something that's there and I've been preparing for for the last 20 years to work for you, the members, and to make the party grow and go in the right direction. Thank you so much. And now back to Anna. This time I promise I won't interrupt you. So I do apologize again for that. And I apologize to listeners. Anna, whenever you're ready, one minute. No problem. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, normally I would be dialing in from Ebiguit, also known as Prince Edward Island, um, which is my home province. Um, but today I'm joining you right next to my co-leadership uh, running mate, Chad. Um, we're connecting with you from uh, Vancouver, and I want to acknowledge the territory that I'm on, which is uh, the home of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations who've uh, stewarded this land for, since time immemorial. Um, to introduce myself, I've been around the party for a good long time, including in countries that I've lived in before arriving in Canada. Here in Canada, I've been the president of the Green Party of PEI, um, who are now official opposition, and I've run since gaining my citizenship in the last two federal elections, achieving 26% of the vote in 2019 and being in the top four candidates in the country uh, in the last election. I professionally have worked as a climate justice campaigner uh, with Greenpeace International and 350.org, and I look forward to answering everyone's questions during the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. Oh, and now you're hey, no. Oh, there we are. Oh, okay. I'll start over. <laughs> Hi, it's uh, just a coincidence. I also happen to be in Vancouver today, not in my home territory of Saanich and the Gulf Islands, but I'm here on the traditional territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish peoples, and I acknowledge with gratitude their protection of this land. It was actually on invitation of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish that I uh, came to Ver Burnaby Mountain to get uh, to fighting fighting Kinder Morgan's pipeline and getting arrested. Then, well, it's been uh, an extremely important part of my life to serve the Green Party of Canada. Many may not know that the Green Party of Canada has been the most successful of any of the global family of greens, uh, who of greens suffering under first past the post. We've done better than any other green party under first past the post and that's because i agree with sarah it's always the collective we are a grassroots party it's never one person but the job of leader is to be the chief spokesperson and to inspire and mobilize and thank i want you. to to serve in that capacity thank you elizabeth now jonathan one minute to yourself whenever you're ready Thank you for joining us. My name is Jonathan and I'm calling from Calgary on the traditional territories of uh, the Treaty Seven Nations in Southern Alberta and the Métis Nation uh, in Region 3. Um, today I want to talk to you about leadership. You will be choosing the next leader of the Green Party of Canada, the next leaders of the Green Party of Canada, the people that will be standing up to make sure that this country lives up to its responsibilities, its moral responsibilities, but it's also its responsibilities under international law to reduce our emissions and to protect our communities from coast to coast to coast uh, in, who are facing the dramatic effects of a changing climate. Elizabeth and I are bringing uh, 50 plus years of joint experience to the table. Uh, we've worked uh, with media, we've worked with politicians, my background is in journalism and human rights reporting. I'm someone who comes to politics from the world of listening. I think that there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done in this party to listen. And I look forward to listening to you members, people who have hold this party together for so long. Thank you. And now last for our opening statements, we will go to Chad. Chad, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chris, for having us. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Chad Walcott. I'm also joining you from uh, Vancouver with my lovely co-leader, uh, Anna Keenan. Uh, you know, for myself, I have over 10 years experience working in politics, social development, and community engagement. I've been a leader uh, for the better part of, a, you know, at least a third of my life, working with communities to empower uh, local communities to achieve results uh, that are important to them. I've worked as an advisor to politicians at the city of Montreal. I've worked in fundraising for cancer and Alzheimer's research. Uh, I've worked with kids. I've worked uh, you know, all over our community to have lasting positive impact. 
uh, I want to bring those skills to the Green Party of Canada and help alongside Anna bring the party to its next level. Together, we have a wealth of experience in mobilizing communities and achieving tangible results, taking our ideas from conception to delivery uh, for the communities that we serve. And we're ready and willing to serve the Green Party of Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, for keeping to close to one minute for all of you. Um, we are now going to be turning to the actual biggest portion of the debate, and that is the questions. This question, we will be starting off with Simon to begin with this question. And that question is, as you can imagine, we had a substantial number of questions submitted by Canadians about climate change. This particular question was posed by Henry from Fredericton, and we hybrided this question with somebody else because they were so close, and Samantha from St. John's East. The question is as follows. Hurricane Fiona, the abundance of forest fires in British Columbia, the rising temperatures around the world, to name only a few, are the direct impact of climate change. We are heading over the cliff of no return if something isn't done today. While this government and official opposition don't seem to be taking the impacts of climate change seriously, how can you as leader slash co-leaders make this a priority for this government and or the next government? Simon, whenever you're ready, your one minute starts. Yes, so Thank you, Henry and Samantha, for, for that question. I think uh, we, we all share the, the worries regarding all that. And we all see the inaction of the uh, liberals uh, that are in power since 2015. And since they are there, like uh, everything got worse. The, the, uh, the ex exploration of fossil fuel uh, increased, the uh, emission increased, everything got worse. But on the other hand, they're saying they have the best uh, the best way of doing things on the international world. Uh, last week, uh, Freeland was saying that the liberals have everything in hand that it was going forward. I think that we need to be there. We need to grow. We need to get more green in the government uh, to win seat and to make sure that we uh, bring new policies and that we act. We need to stop the exploration of fossil fuel, stop the project like we saw in bids and all, and now they want to do more as like those projects. Uh, we need to, to be there to, to tell the people that the reality and the, the, the truth, because the liberals are not saying the truth. They're just lying. And after saying that they're doing something, but they're not doing anything. Thank you. Now we will turn to Anna for her one minute response to that question. I will say if you want me to re repeat the question, I am happy to do that. Just please ask that before you start answering. So whenever you're ready, Anna, your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Henry and Samantha for their question. Um, of course, living on Prince Edward Island, my, my home got smoked by Hurricane Fiona as well and was out of power for 19 days but in the middle of the leadership race. That was super fun. Um, but yeah, the, the question was around what can we do with this government and the next government? How can we influence change? I think it's important for Canadians to recognize that under the last 20 years um, of governments in Canada, our emissions have not reduced at all. We've succeeded in reducing emissions in certain sectors, but they have the, the savings we've had in certain sectors, electricity in particular, have been more than made up for by increases in transportation emissions and emissions from the oil and gas sector. And those two areas are where we need particular attention. Chad and I are big uh, champions of the proposals from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to address public transport and active transportation in our cities. And to influence the next government, what we need to do is get the party organized so that we win more seats and can negotiate in the balance of power. Thank you so much, Anna. Next, we'll go to Elizabeth. Elizabeth, one minute whenever you're ready. Thanks. This question is brilliant that it really brings together what we have, which in terms of urgency, we have the advice of scientists and we have the political agenda. And as ever, it's the political agenda and the short term thinking of politicians to the next election that have sabotaged and undermined our ability to listen to science. Here's where we are on the science. According to the April 4th report of the third working group of the sixth assessment report, we have to ensure that we stop adding emissions globally and start subtracting them before 2025. 
Otherwise, the window closes on 1.5 or 2 degrees. Now, 2025 is the political agenda. That's where the NDP have given the liberals a free ride until 2025, which means how do we, how do I, if I am leader and co-leader with Jonathan Peno, make a difference before 2025? We have to cause the liberals real pain. We have to make them really worried about the next election. They can't cruise. They have to cancel TMX, cancel Beta Nor, and get serious. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jonathan, your one minute starts whenever you're ready. Thank you for the question, uh, Henry and Samantha. I was also uh, uh, lucky uh, enough to uh, speak with people on Magdalene Island uh, shortly after Fiona. Uh, it was uh, it was a, definitely a very dramatic event. I was recently on the Sunshine Coast uh, as early as uh, this week, in fact, which is now experiencing water shortages. Uh, so clearly, the signs of climate change are uh, visible for most Canadians uh, from you know throughout the country. Uh, we need to get more Greens elected. That is how we are to increase the pressure on the liberals the liberals and the, and the conservatives and the NDP. Uh, we need to also uh, be a stable house that can accommodate other MPs from these parties that may be disappointed with their party's own uh, climate policies and environmental policies. There's a lot of MPs that are unhappy with the way the liberals have been dealing with the climate emergency uh, and who might be amenable to join us if only we have the right and strong leadership that this party deserves. Thank you, Jonathan. Chad, one minute to you whenever you're ready. Absolutely, and thank you for the question. Um, for those of you who know me, you'll know that I cut my teeth in politics, mobilizing in the streets to put pressure on the government. It's what I do now professionally uh, in my day job before I, uh, I joined the race. Uh, what we need to do and what Anna and I have put in our six month plan is to rebuild relationships with civil society advocacy, with nonprofit organizations that share our policy priorities. We need to elevate their voices and start hitting the pressure points in this government. We don't have to wait till the next election. We don't have to wait to elect 12 members, though when we elect 12 members, will be able to have much more of an impact but we can start today right after right on november 20th after one of us is elected or two of us are elected so to work with uh civil society advocates to pressure the government to make changes now you know we had the fridays for future protests uh on on the climate march earlier this year we need to mobilize people to march again on on uh, the house of commons and on parliament to demand that this government take action today and not wait until 2025 Thank you, Chad. Sarah, to finalize the one minute uh, answer to this question, whenever you're ready. Greens are already leaders in our communities. We are creating the infrastructures now that future generations will need to survive and thrive in the era of climate change. It is here. It is just a matter of how bad it's going to get. The solutions that we are doing in our communities include local food security and small scale energy solutions. So it, as the leader, it's my job to get us together at policy table talks, which we will be having, and we will be creating a national food security mandate. We need to capitalize on our superpowers and our party is full of local small scale organic growers and local small scale energy suppliers and cooperatives in our community right across the country. We need to capitalize on our superpowers. We do not necessarily need to outreach to special interest groups and NGOs. Members have told us what they want us to focus on. It includes things like Ecoside and you can see all of it on my website. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. Now, we are going to go to a uh, uh, chance for anyone wants to have an extra 30 seconds. Please raise your hand so that way I can see Elizabeth, Jonathan, anyone else? Okay, so we will start with Elizabeth on this one. Elizabeth, 30 seconds to yourself whenever you're ready. Thank you. I just, I, you know, there's nothing that is in terms of rebuttal. I think we all agree. Um, this is structured as, as being like a debate. Uh, the reality of it is, and I wanted to add, we've seen in British Columbia much more damage than most Canadians know. We had 700 people die in four days. We are completely unprepared for the climate impacts that are coming at us. And our government is still expanding fossil fuels. Because I'm already in Parliament, we can make a bigger difference and we can make it fast. 
Thank you, Jonathan. 30 seconds to yourself for a follow up, I will say from now on instead of a rebuttal. But follow up, Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'd like to uh, point out to the fact that this emergency cannot be left out to future generations to fix. This needs to be fixed now. It needs to be fixed by, by governments. Uh, we need to have strong governmental action. We need to have strong government investments. Uh, this can happen through pressures in the streets, uh, but the reality of it is that we've had lots of demonstrations over the past several years, and sadly enough, governments do not listen. So our best chance is to replace these governments. And in order to do that, we need to have the right leadership that will bring in new members of parliaments for the Greens uh, in 2025 Thank or you, earlier. Thank you, Jonathan. We will, uh, will one last time. Anyone else want to follow up here? Going once, going twice. Sold. Question number two. And we will be starting with Anna on this question. Foreign policy was the second most asked topic of submissions in the questions regarding, and they were regarding China and Russia. This question comes from, and I apologize if I pronounce this name incorrectly here, Hamir from Ottawa Vanier. The question is as follows. Our global economy has become dependent on the whims of what happens in China and Russia. With the ongoing war in Ukraine, and the global supply dominance of China, Canada has become a servant of what is happening outside of our country. How do you plan to challenge the foreign influence that countries like Russia and China have on our country? One minute to yourself, Anna, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for the question, Hamir. I think the the influences on Canada from other countries are uh, varied and diverse. Um, there is, we certainly have a lot of influence from our large neighbor uh, immediately to the south of us. But again, the, the other large countries, India, China, Russia, are uh, influential powers on, on the world uh, stage. I, I don't find it helpful to, to label countries as, as Christian Freeland did just recently into you know, democracies and authoritarian countries and create these divisions. I believe that we need to uh, be encouraging uh, exchange of information, strengthening of civil society across all countries, but particularly on trade, um, I believe in import replacement policies um, so that we're less dependent on uh, the imported goods um, from these other countries. We need to build strong supply chains and local manufacturing value added processing here in Canada so that we're keeping jobs um, in Canada and it also reduces environmental impact at the same time. Thank you, Anna. Elizabeth, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Thank you. And thanks thanks for the question, Hamir. I think this gives me an opportunity to put in a little preamble. The leader of the Green Party, as much as we individually and collectively have great ideas, does not determine the policies of the Green Party. This is one of our great strengths. Our members meeting in biannual general meetings determine our policies. So your question is one where I, I will take it to be a question of personal opinion, but let's say our global green values are really important here. We're a party that is firmly entrenched in looking at global solutions, recognizing we're a human family and that nationalism doesn't fit with global green values particularly well. Let me just say that I think we need to invest in multilateralism. Canada is a soft power, uh, ne never has been, there's never been a time when Canada hasn't been dominated by foreign influence, as Anna suggested. We've usually had the United States determining most everything about our foreign policy. I've never, I don't think we, we should have that, but our ability to make a difference in the world is through cooperation and multilateralism. Thank you so much. Next, we will go to Jonathan. Jonathan, whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. I'll say this. I came uh, back to Canada after nine years uh, living abroad and 14 years working on international issues, uh, including on uh, the recent conflict in Ukraine. Being in Ukraine, uh, I don't have much sympathy for the Russian regime nor the Chinese regime. I think they are uh, revisionist powers and imperialist powers the same way the United States is and has been for many, many decades in many parts of the world. Uh, we need strong multilateral institutions if we are to address the global challenge that the climate emergency constitutes, not just for Canadians, uh, but for people throughout the world. Uh, we now know, and we've known for a while, that the rich nations 
institutions of which we are a part will uh, come out much better uh, than uh, poorer nations uh, that have been exploited repeatedly for centuries by uh, dominating powers. Canada has a role as a medium player. It can be an honest broker in these international disputes, but in order to do that, we need to craft our own independent foreign policy, which we haven't done uh, for many years. Canada is not back into the world. So the green will take Canada back into the world. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Chad, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you for the question, Hamir. Um, so I, I've had a chance to kind of experience the effects of, of kind of ch uh, Canada's free trade and, and exportative uh, policies firsthand. You know, I, I was helped I helped revitalize uh, Canada's old, or uh, Montreal's old manufacturing district, which uh, had shipped out to China, actually. So what I think we can do to, to lessen the influence of foreign uh, giants like China and like Russia in our affairs and in our supply chains is to invest in local communities and invest in this, ensuring that we can produce goods here. Uh, you know, green policy, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, calls for fair trade. You know, we have to we have to put Canadians first when we think about the trade that we do in this multilateral world uh, with other with other giants in the in economics. And I think if we invest in uh, increasing our capacity here, whether it's in pharma care, whether it's in uh, manufacturing, we can do a lot to reduce the impacts of, of this uh, unstable world. Thank you, Chad. We will go to Sarah next. Sarah, a minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Uh, if you just Google CPAC, Sarah Gabrielle Barron, you'll see that the day after Pierre Polyev became leader of the Conservative Party, that I did a press conference in the West Bloc, holding them to account because they talk about, oh, inflation, inflation, they blame the Liberals, but it was Stephen Harper and Pierre Polyev who brought in the FIPA, which locked Canada into a bad free trade agreement. And Greens have been saying for decades in our policy book that we would get out of free trade agreements and we would renegotiate them as free trade agreements. We need to look at the relationship between our economy and our military. And Greens have been saying since 1988 that we would get out of NATO and we would focus our peacekeeping efforts at the United Nations level, particularly the General Assembly. The climate crisis requires that we do become more resilient at the local level. And it is, so it's not oh, a choice at this point. We have to, and you can see my ideas that are member-based <laughs> on my website. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Simon, last minute to you whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Amir, for, for the question. Uh, I think I always have to start from the reality. Uh, Canada is doing business with China. Canada was also and is doing business with Russia. Uh, I think there was a lack of diplomacy in the past, like uh, our government didn't interact with those authoritarian government. I agree, but we have business with them. We need to talk to them, have communication, and make sure that things are going in the right way. And that way, we could avoid crisis like we're seeing right now in Ukraine. If the government has done its job to keep relationship with, yes, authoritarian leaders that I don't agree with, Canada needs to be a model with a strong foreign policy. And for that, we need to develop it and act like it. Right now, the liberals are not doing that. They have no foreign policy. They just align with the United States. And we are not independent as a country and show that uh, we are there to collaborate with every country that try to grow, develop. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so with that, that was our last speaker on the question. Does anyone want 30 seconds to follow up on this question? Jonathan, we will go to you for 30 seconds. Hold on two seconds. Let me reset and get my sign all ready for you. Whenever you're ready, 30 seconds. Oh, did anyone else want to before we go with Jonathan? Anna and Sarah. So hold on. So Jonathan, Anna, and Sarah. Jonathan, 30 seconds to yourself whenever you're ready. Well, I'd just like to add that the, the, the school of thinking that trade and trade agreements prevent conflict, that's, that's a very liberal uh, approach to international 
relations. Uh, I think we need to have a values uh, based approach. We are a small nation. We need to uh, communicate with our neighbors and with other countries in the world, but we need to live up to our own values and our own moral values. Uh, China and Russia are not countries where we can do, uh, you know, where we can strengthen civil society. There is no civil society that can work in these countries because people are being jailed and beaten up and tortured. Thank you, Jonathan. We will now go to Anna, Anna, you have 30 seconds whenever you're ready. Well, I, I actually think it's highly hyperbolic to say that there's no civil society in China and Russia. I've worked directly with colleagues in international civil society that are headquartered in Beijing and in Moscow. And I know that a very important role of Canada's foreign policy can be investing in and collaborating with civil society organizations. Both Russia and China have extremely limited media environments and citizen access to information is key in enabling those citizens to strengthen and improve their societies in the future and Canada can make interventions to help support those citizens. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I did see someone's hand raised. So after Sarah, someone you will go. So Sarah, 30 seconds to yourself whenever you're ready. Yeah, you know, Hamir's question is really sweeping, right? And so when I was mentioning my platform, if you go to the part under sustainability, it's about economic reform. So we, the Greens have been pre creating ideas around macroeconomic reform, microeconomic reform, but we need to realize that Canada is a colonialist country and that our companies based in Canada, in Quebec, in Toronto, and in Vancouver are some of the worst extractive damaging companies around the world. We need to take responsibility for that. Thank you, Sarah. And now, Simon, whenever you're ready. Yes. Uh, OK, thank you, Chris. So I, I want to, to trade agreements are there. I'm not saying I want to go that way. They are there. So we have to start from reality. We have to deal with that. Trade agreements exist. Then we have to manage that. It's not just, just like the. Uh, wishful thinking of, oh, uh, we'll start everything new. No, we have to start from reality if we want to change things. And they are there. And there's possible if there's no way to go into China, diplomatic interaction exists. And Canada needs to be more, uh, go forward with that because that's very important. That's our role as a, as a country. Thank you. We will get one last call for any follow-ups on this before we go to question three. Oh. I'm so tempted. I can't resist the 30 seconds. Oh, hold on. Okay, Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm just going to throw. You only have one left. Yeah, <laughs> you'll have one left after this, Elizabeth. So 30 seconds, Elizabeth, whenever you're ready. Look, I've, you know, I've done a lot of work on trade deals, and I want to differentiate, not to be picky, but FIPA isn't a trade deal. There are no trade elements in it. It's one of the most pernicious. It's the investor pr promotion and protection agreements. And what they do is give corporations greater rights than governments. I've been in the forefront of work on this, and we have a solution, which is to ensure that all the agreements within the WTO are made subservient to the Paris Agreement, that we understand the bottom line is that we must reduce greenhouse gases. That's job one. And any trade deals that get in the way of climate should be put to the side. And we can get Thank agreement on that through. you, Elizabeth. And we will leave it on you because question three starts with Elizabeth May. Unless, sorry, one last time, going once, going twice, seeing no hands. We're moving on to question three. Question three. Three is starting with Elizabeth May. And the question is, uh, the future of the Green Party of Canada has been in the news lately. And over 40 submissions came in on this topic alone. We took two questions from the submissions and wanted to pose them both to you, but as a hybrid question. The question comes from Jonathan from Nanaimo Ladysmith and Brenda from Regina Quapella. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. I know one of you will correct me on that right away. So here we are. So the question is, the Green Party of Canada has been adrift for the last year. The party's turmoil has been spilled over to the media and it's making the party less of a viable option going forward. Brenda, in her statement when she submitted, said she wasn't even sure if she was going to buy a membership to vote in the leadership race due to the ongoing frustration she had with the current party. 
How will you, as leader slash co-leader, ensure that the Green Party of Canada remains a viable option for Canadians from coast to coast to coast? Elizabeth, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Oh, uh, you're muted, Elizabeth. <laughs> oh, First, th thanks to, to Brenda and Jonathan for an excellent question that's on everyone's mind. Thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for being here right now with uh, Chris Brown and our, our great group of candidates. Let me point something out. People in the media want to talk about turmoil and things filling out. We have shown in a leadership race that we build each other up. We don't tear each other down. We largely agree on key issues. And one of the things I think we agree on, we may have different routes to get there, is we have to get our act together. We have to show Canadians that we are united, that we are a party that knows how to present a solid platform, that we will work hard. And frankly, we're the only option there is. The only the Green Party is prepared to speak honestly to the real threats to our future. Only the Green Party is prepared to say out loud, we have to cancel the TMX pipeline. We have to stop beta nor. We have to ban fracking. We have to stop adding and start subtracting to our greenhouse gas contributions to uh, what now threatens our future. And thank you for asking the question. Thank you, Elizabeth. We will now move on to Jonathan. Jonathan, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Thanks for the question, uh, Brenda and Jonathan. Um, I think it's crucial that we have a party where members feel hurt internally um, in order to ensure that we don't end up with stories out in the news media uh, that affect our credibility as a political party and our ability to engage in actual political work in the House of Commons, which is where the policies that all the, the members uh, have crafted uh, can be implemented. Uh, in order to do that, we do need to rebuild trust. We do need to have accountability. We do need to have leaders who listen and leaders who work uh, to propose solutions uh, with the membership. Elizabeth and I have engaged with media throughout this race. Uh, we've had the opportunity to do several interviews to cast this party under a positive light and to bring back the attention onto the crisis uh, that brought us to the Green Party in the first place, the climate emergency, which will require a strong Green Party of Canada uh, for us to face in the future. Thank you, Jonathan. Chad, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you, Jonathan and Brenda, for the question. You know, um, the, prior to entering the race, I was the chief electoral uh, officer, I guess. No, the CEO, chief executive, uh, chief executive <laughs> officer, thank you, of my local electoral district association. Um, and during the last crisis uh, of leadership that we had last year, uh, you know, our, our association was starting to lose members on our executive, members at large. So what I did is I convened a meeting of the members to talk about how to move forward together on common footing. And the thing I asked them is, why did you become a member of the Green Party of Canada? And it wasn't because of a particular leader or a particular candidate. It was because we believe in the values and policies that the Green Party of Canada pushes forward. Anna and I have not been talking to media as much to, to get the record straight. We've gone and we've talked to members. We've talked to members at large. We've talked to members of the, the fund. We've talked to members of council. And we have a solid plan on how to get the party back together that's based on three pillars, renewal, responsibility, and results. And we're absolutely ready to put that to work to get our party back on its feet. Thank you so much, Chad. Sarah, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Yeah, we need to value our volunteers more than anything else. We need to return to having fun. That's the home of fun and the Green Party of Canada is in our electoral district associations. We need to um, have our policy process be interesting. I've been the champion of our policy process within the Green Party of Canada since 2005. And we need to increase our confidence. And that means a cohesion of political messaging. And so those flows between the membership and the leader's office need to be having constantly. I'll be convening nightly policy table talks that any member can attend. Your shadow cabinet representative will be there. It's so easy to do to feel that, that sense of being a part of the family 
And I have read every uh, election postmortem since inception. And I'm sorry to say that these problems have been going on for 17 years. And it is time to have a leader's office that believes in, in constantly having those flows of communication, not just at election time. Thank you so much, Simon. Whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's very important with everything we left in, in the, the last year since the last election. Uh, it was a lot of turmoil. And I think that, yes, the members are there for the green principles, for the policies, and they want things to change. But the rhythm of a political party is given by the leader. And uh, the leader will create the environment and the this, this space and the, where people will be able to interact and feel confident and trust and that uh, they, they can go and be themselves and share and, and help like uh, uh, make that party the place that will bring innovation, that will lead us in the right way where we can like be the government, change things and make sure that we bring our society in the right direction because right now it is not going in the direction so it's for us to say to to build that inside the party build that that space where we share we work together and we go forward thank you so much and we will end the one minute statements with anna on this question anna whenever you're ready one minute to yourself thank you um thank you jonathan brenda it's an excellent uh question many greens have felt embarrassed to to be associated with the party in the last few years but are holding tight because of the values that we all hold so dear um, i think there are three key areas that we have to address if we're going to rebuild the party in the eyes of the canadian public one we need excellent communications i think chad and i are proving that we're excellent communicators our media coverage has been very positive the way that we frame our messages um, we also need very strong anti-harassment and anti-bullying um, policies within the party. These have been neglected for too long. I appreciate the work that council has been doing to move us towards implementing those policies, but we need them in place and being acted on today. We also need to be investing deeply in the capacity of our EDAs to run high ambition campaigns in their writing. There is nothing stopping any EDA member out there from choosing to run a high ambitious campaign raising $50,000, recruiting 150 volunteers, getting 1,000 signs out at the next election. That's how we're going to build this party. Thank you so much, Anna. So as everyone has had their one minute, we will say, is there anyone with some follow-ups on this one before we move on to the next question? So does anyone want a 30-second follow-up? Sarah, you will go first. Anyone else while we sit here going once, going twice? Sarah, 30 seconds to yourself whenever you're ready. I just want to build out a little bit more around what is division of powers. It means that our politicians stay as politicians and they let our federal council and our fund that are volunteers do their job. Um, the leader's office requires way more transparency and my leader's office will let, will let members know how those movements of power between the different units happen. And most importantly, I'm deeply committed to evolving us towards restorative justice ways of dealing with inter-member conflict. Thank you so much, Sarah. Oh, Chad is going to go for his first one. Let me just do a little X here. Chad... Whenever you're ready, 30 seconds to yourself. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. So one thing I want to add is I think the reason the party is going through this kind of identity crisis and prolonged tumultuous period of transition is that past leadership has failed to build up leaders to take over uh, and, and, and plan for the future. I think that what, what the party needs now are two leaders that have experience with dealing with conflict resolution, with dealing with governance, and uh, have a proven track record of getting results. You know, we can go backwards, but I think we should go forwards with two people who have experience within the party for long term. Thank you. Chad, going once, going twice. We are moving on to question four. Question four, we will be starting with Jonathan on this question. Surprisingly, these questions came from different people, but they were the exact same question. I'm not sure if they're related, but they submitted similar questions, but they just change the different cities that they lived in. The question is about affordable housing and the increasing houselessness populations in Canada. It is asked from Trevor in Vancouver Quadra and 
Zedic, Z-E-D-I-C, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong, from Toronto Centre. The question is as follows. The affordability crisis in Canada is at an all-time high. Canadians are struggling to get by and get into their first home. We see prices in metro cities like Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal increasing every day, which is causing more and more Canadians to become homeless. How do we tackle the affordable housing crisis quickly so we don't see an increase in our most vulnerable population who are left homeless because they can't afford even the basic necessity of housing? Jonathan, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Trevor Zidik, thank you for the question. This is an urgent question for so many Canadians throughout the country. It requires urgent action. That action can take place in Ottawa. That action can take place if we have strong leadership that starts in Ottawa from November 20th. And that is moving forward. Now, moving forward, I think we do need uh, to have more investments by the federal government in building uh, affordable infrastructure and co-ops. This is something, this is a field, an entire field that the federal government has vacated, vacated uh, for the past 20 years. There needs to be urgent investments into that. We also need to look into uh, pushing forward more aggressively our messaging on guaranteed livable income. Uh, but we, but, but, but that's just part of the answer because we also know that there's a lot of speculation going around. A lot of people who own several properties that there needs to be stronger regulations on on, on ownership. And we need to give extra help to the younger people uh, like like me and and so many others uh, who are struggling to get access to property. And that passes through, once again, federal investments. Thank you, Jonathan. Chad, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you. So as, as this period of inflation is going on, we see the fossil fuel industry making profits hand over fist. In order to be able to invest in building more affordable housing for people so that we can turn housing from a profit margin to a right, we need to go and we need to be bold enough to tax the oil industry and regulate it heavily. And then take those extra revenues and invest them in building affordable housing, in making free education for the trades so we can address the labor shortage that we have in trades workers so we can actually have people working to build new houses. Um, I don't know if, if many of you listening have had a chance or had an attempt to try to do any renovations or, or any repairs to your homes lately, but you'll know that trying to find good handy people to do the work and do the work of constructing new houses uh, is very difficult. Uh, we need to invest in free education. We need to address this labor shortage by opening up the amount of uh, workers that we can put to the task and we need more investment from the federal government to do so. Thank you, Chad. Sarah, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. I love giving the collective the credit. At our last policy conference, we passed, um, a, a, you can go to the Leadership Race website, ignore us leaders and go to yourselves, go to the policy process on the far right tab. And so you just click in um, housing, you'll see that we voted for caps on rent and land ownership, targeted taxation to combat speculation, inclusionary zoning, and um, cooperating the federal level, cooperating with the provinces, because this is a provincial issue, um, but cooperating with the provinces um, to get better affordable housing happening. However, we also need to give Greens the credit. Greens are doing this in our communities. In Peterborough, they're working with um, a group called Paths to create tiny homes. Greens are the leaders across the country on what cooperative housing looks like. And so we will be having policy table talks on this subject where your shadow cabinet representative will be there and we will create a very clear and focused national campaign. Thank you, Sarah. Simon, whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. Thank you, uh, Trevor and Zedek, for the question. So I believe in the principle that housing is a human right. I also recognize that there are many facets to initiating this principle in our current capitalist economy. But what we can do is introduce legislation to limit the role of corporation to the building of new family homes and initial home sales and not the buying and selling of existing family homes. For rental unit, I do not see how we can, in the current capitalist economy, get around the corporate buying and reselling of apartment buildings, as outlined, this will create havoc in rental market. 
I strongly advocate that the federal and provincial government should set up a program of building mixed income apartment unit to apply downward pressure on the rental market. Leaving the rental market entirely in private end is a huge mistake. That being said, I have no problem with individual buying a second home and renting it out in or investment income or individual uh, investing in the purchase of a primary residence with the hope that the price will increase for their retirement or to downsize there. Thank you so much. We will now move on to Anna. Anna, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. And thank you, Trevor and Zedek for the question. Um, and I'll say that much of the answer that Simone has just gave um, with you know, various specific policies really resonates with uh, the approach I'd like to see on housing as well. I believe that there is no silver bullet for fixing the housing market. Um, this is a result of years and even decades of neglect for the housing market in Canada. Um, and the, the problem is multifaceted. That being said, I think there are policy interventions that we can make which will generate results in the short term, notably regulating short-term rentals like Airbnbs across Canada. That has um, contributed to about 30% of the cost increases that we've seen over the last five years. It's very well studied and regulating that could, could reduce prices in the housing market very quickly. Um, we also need a housing first policy to address homelessness, just giving people homes instead of setting up complex and expensive systems of shelters. And we need to support the work that Mike Morris has been doing um, to bring forward a private members bill to uh, appropriately tax real estate investment trusts. There's lots of long term solutions, too, but that's the short term stuff. Thank you, Anna. Elizabeth, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. We've had in the Green Party of Canada for a long time member driven policies that look at the issues of housing and homelessness and specifically that distinction that a house is primarily a home and not a, a source of investment speculation, but our tax treatments do encourage investment speculations. Mike and I both have been working in Parliament on his motion 71 to eliminate the preferential tax treatment of real estate investment trusts, the REITs. We need to go back, as we've been advocating for years as Greens, to the federal tax treatment of purpose-built rental housing, what used to be called MERBs. We need to get more properties available for people who can afford to rent them. Jonathan started this discussion out by saying people his age who want to get into the housing market, okay, I'm 68, I don't own anything. I'd like to get in the housing market. It's very difficult when the market is so distorted by greed and speculation. I agree with Anna, Airbnbs need to be advanced and need to be regulated and to be controlled. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, that was the last person to answer that question. We will ask, does anyone want to follow up for 30 seconds on this question? Going once, going twice. On to question number five. And just to let everyone know, Sarah, you have one follow-up left. Simon, you have two. Anna, you have two. Elizabeth, you have one. Jonathan, you have one. And Chad, you have two. Question five, and we are starting with Chad on this question. The next topic will be on infrastructure. The question comes from Zach in Edmonton Center. Five years ago, the Canadian government set up the Canadian Infrastructure Bank with $35 billion to invest in large revenue-generating infrastructure projects alongside private partners. So far, the CIB has fallen short of its mandate and has been described as a failure. Should, C should the CIB be abolished or can it be reoriented towards building more publicly owned climate resilient infrastructure? Sorry for reading that really slowly. I read that 12 times and I kept on saying the bank each time I did it in practice. So I'm not trying to say CIBC. I'm trying to say CIB, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. So Chad, whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. Absolutely. And thank you for the question. Um, you know, I mentioned off the top that we have to do more work regulating and taxing our fossil fuel industry. We also have to do more work to invest in renewable technologies. You know, we can use that fund, I think, to start tapping into Calgary's untapped uh, thermal, um, geothermal uh, network. Uh, we can tap into wind, we can invest in solar energy. Uh, throughout any of these things, we have to think about a just transition from uh, the fossil fuel to 
renewable energies that Canada can be a leader on in the international stage. And to do that well, we have to think about the indigenous communities and their consent about developing on their land. We have to think about the local uh, communities that live around uh, these extraction sites and work with them to plan the just transition so nobody gets left behind, as we saw in Ontario when they moved away from coal. Um, we have to be ambitious with our climate policy. We have to start working together as communities to find solutions that are long lasting and that can allow Canada to be a leader in renewable energy throughout the world. Thank you, Chad. Sarah, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Uh, yeah, yet again, I am reading directly from our uh, last policy process, use public and central banking to address public emergencies and build a green economy. So yeah, it's how we use our banking systems, right? And Greens are always saying that we need to care about those future generations. And so on the so there's there's two levels, right? There's the level where our MPs are working and and supporting national campaigns like what um, like what's happening with Mike and Elizabeth on Motion Bill C-71. We need to have better national campaigns in our social media supporting the work that they're doing. But on the ground level, we need to be showing that Canadians are, that green Canadians are already working on these kinds of things in our communities. So yeah, I mean, the, the financial systems that are hurting us can be repurposed to help us? And this is an excellent question. Thank you, Sarah. Simon, whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. Yes, thank you for the, the question, Zach. It's an interesting question. Uh, we talked about it at the last election because the CIB, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, is a real joke. Uh, we saw some pretty wealthy entrepreneurs who were renting some unit to their own family, saying that was like for people who needed some uh, some affordable uh, uh, apartment. And it was like the program is a real joke. The program is is should be like uh, strapped and rebuilt uh, with uh, different uh, uh, direction and real like. Uh, uh, real interest to help people in needs because that program is just helping uh, people who don't need help and it's giving them like a, just more profit right now and it's not helping so it's poor organizing poor planning by the liberals and uh, yes i think we should do better and we need to organize that because it's very important to build our city properly so everybody has a home and everybody feel good in their city but right now it's just like to Fill the pocket of the uh, some entrepreneur. Thank you, Simon. Anna, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. And yet again, Simone, going after you, I feel like, yes, that's a well-expressed critique. Um, good job. I think the, the Liberals, unfortunately, they have a habit of uh, what I call governing by press release, which means that they'll make uh, a big fancy press release when they announce something like a $35 billion new infrastructure package, but um, they rarely give a press release to show what are the results at the end of such a project because the, the results rarely materialize. Um, I think that this uh, a reorientation of the infrastructure bank towards renewable energy, building the green economy um, would be very well placed. And I know this is a this is an investment bank because they're expecting the projects to also return economic revenues into the Canadian economy. Um, Intercity rail, high speed rail in the Quebec uh, to Windsor corridor, upscaling battery manufacturing and recycling vehicle to grid technology, demand side management technology. These are all areas that need investment and they will be profitable sectors that drive forward a green industrial policy in Canada. Thank you, Anna. Elizabeth, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. I, as I understand the question is very specifically on the entity, the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, which is very much of concern because it prioritizes public-private partnerships. We need investment in infrastructure and it must remain public. I have to say of critiquing the Canadian Infrastructure Bank, I've been impressed that some of their investments have been specifically in interties to work to get our electrical grid to work east-west. It doesn't now, it only works north-south. We need to have those investments, but they must remain public. So the Canadian Infrastructure Bank is something of smoke and mirrors. It was launched by the Liberals with the, uh, the notion that it was going to mobilize billions of dollars in private capital 
to go into public projects. That doesn't tend to work. They want to see return on investment. That undermines the public interest in public infrastructure. But I want to emphasize the electricity grid. That's the big national infrastructure energy project to make sure we can get renewable energy from one province to the other when it's needed. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jonathan, you will end this question whenever you're ready. One minute to yourself. Thank you, Zach, for the question. And it's a very precise question on the CIB and its investments, uh, its, its ongoing investments. I was today discussing with uh, conservationists, uh, cons conservationists here in, in Calgary who were uh, telling me about these massive uh, irrigation projects that are currently being financed by the CIB and the government of Alberta uh, to uh, uh, without any form of environmental impact assessment. Uh, we need to make sure that every single money spent by the federal government is uh, subjected uh, on these infrastructure programs is subjected to environment uh, environmental impact assessments, uh, federal ones, not just provincial ones. Uh, but this country needs uh, resilient infrastructure in the face of uh, the climate emergency. We know that we will need more irrigation. We know that we will need more public transportation. The high-speed train is one example. Uh, we also need to invest in protecting our uh, our coast uh, from, uh, from 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 uh, uh, from 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 the sea rise uh, and protect our communities from coast to coast. And that will require investments. Thank you, Jonathan. As that was our final response to that question, we will ask: Is there anyone wanting to follow up on that question? Going once, going twice, seeing no hands, let's move on to question number six. And this question, we will be starting with Sarah. The question of immigration and refugees will end our question and answer segment. Again, this question is a hybrid question from two submissions from the writings of Ville-Marie Les Soudes Il des Sors and Halifax. The question is... Canada has always tried to be a welcoming place. We help those who are hurting and try to give immigrants and refugees a helping hand when here. COVID-19, though, has been tough time for Canadians. With labor shortages in more rural areas of Canada, how do you see can new Canadians and refugees filling the voids in rural Canada while not adding more pressures on our urban centers? Sarah, whenever you're ready, one minute to yourself. Um, one of my favorite things that came out of the last leadership race was Glenn Murray's leadership around the idea of climate crisis um, newcomer planning needed. So that is one thing that um, my shadow cabinet representative on immigration will be holding monthly table talks because Greens are, this is one of our superpowers. A lot of Greens in our communities are, are helping newcomers come. We are, we are Canadian experts on not only bringing newcomers into Canada, but helping them find jobs, helping them match to communities so that they have that solidarity and that support when they get here. Um, and so I would just like to say that none of the other parties, including the Green Party of Canada, yet has a long-term plan around a refugee, sorry, a newcomer planning that is climate crisis aware and that is a gaping hole that my leadership will help fill through the shadow cabinet representative holding at least monthly table talks that any member can attend thank you sarah simone one minute to yourself whenever you're ready yes uh, that's that's a very important question uh, i'm from uh, an immigrant uh, uh, grandfather who came here in 1923 from uh, from Italia, and I think it's very important. That being said, uh, I want to bring up like the plan of the liberals who just want to increase the numbers of immigrants from 300,000 to 450,000. So uh, that's the project century from uh, a boys club in Toronto who decided that, and Justin Trudeau is implementing that right now, and. We, nobody discussed about that. And I, I, we need to do things properly because that means that in 2100, there will be 100 million persons in Canada. 
That means there will be 33,000 million person in Toronto in the great area and 14 million person in Montreal in the great area. So between before uh, 1960, there was nobody in Brussels. Longueuil no was a 5,000 uh, city. So imagine in uh, 2,100, Montreal will go to Saint Jean sur Richelieu. So Thanks. you know we need to talk about that. Ooh, thank you, Simone. We will head off to Anna now. Anna, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you very much. Um, all, all six of us candidates here, and I imagine Chris as well, are either immigrants uh, to Canada or descendants of immigrants quite recently. I believe I'm, I'm the latest uh, import as, as a newer Canadian, got my citizenship in 2018, and I'm a rural resident um, to speak to the, to the issue. I, I don't believe in the idea that uh, we need to pull up the drawbridge behind us and build higher walls and keep people out, especially in the context of the climate crisis we know that you know in our lifetimes in the next 50 years a billion people may have to move um, and Canada can be a, a place of refuge for them we do need to as Sarah said build climate resilient uh, immigration and, and uh, uh, sort of pop human movements uh, strategies and I believe that the 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 main factor influencing where People settle is about rural revitalization policy so that we're not continuing to centralize healthcare, education services, big box stores that into our main urban centers that then hollow out uh, small rural communities like the place that I live. Thank you, Anna. Elizabeth, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Thanks so much for the question. And I, I do think we ought to give a uh, look back and see how much work has been done by our members and globally. We were at the, at the Global Greens gathering. We were the first party around the world to say out loud that we need to redefine the refugee term. Refugees right now have to be uh, escaping political persecution and at risk in their own homeland. We need to recognize climate refugees as a separate class of refugees. We need to be prepared. We need to do a lot more work. And again, Canadian Greens have adopted this strategy as well, adopted this as policy. We need to move forward to recognize that in a, the world of climate crisis, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees is can be measured in tens of millions of people whose homes are no longer habitable. So as we look at the immigration and refugee question, I agree we have to be prepared in Canada. There are vast areas of this country where there are empty schoolhouses and empty homes because of depopulation. We need to figure out the sensitive, compassionate preparedness to ensure that immigration and refugee goes to places that need them. Thank you, Elizabeth. Jonathan, one minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Yeah, I can't agree more with Elizabeth on this. Uh, I've spent a good chunk of my life in refugee camps documenting abuses and the tragic circumstances that push people out of their homes. And we know that there will be more more and more people pushed out of their homes because of the climate crisis, because of the political crises that are born out of a changing environment. And Canada is partly responsible for this situation because we are a first world country that has benefited and whose economy has been built on the extractivism that Sarah was touching upon earlier today. We are at the very top of the pyramid and that bestows upon us great moral responsibilities uh, to, to, to open our arms and to welcome people. But opening our arms isn't enough. My mother works in rural Quebec, uh, helping migrants who come from all parts of the world integrate into this very complex society that Quebec is. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done to support these organizations, uh, to, to train them in getting good jobs, to ensure that they are well integrated in the Canadian family. Thank you, Jonathan. Chad, last minute to yourself whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, Anna and I had the benefit of being at a gala called the Better Together Gala yesterday. And uh, one thing the CEO, whose last time I don't remember, but his first name was Isaac, mentioned is that immigration brings richness to our country. Um, and, and I can't agree more with that statement. You know, we have multiple crises that we're facing here in Canada, notably a healthcare crisis. Meanwhile, we have qualified doctors from, from abroad who we can be putting to work, but we refuse to because there's, we, there's this issue of needing to recertify. And then when they're recertified, there's the issue of where they're allowed to practice. We need to invest in a pan-Canadian licensing uh, for our doctors. We need to make 
reduce the barriers so that foreign doctors and nurses can get to work right away. We need to, in, we need to review our immigration policy to be less systemically racist and allow for French Africans to come to Canada and replenish the French communities outside of Quebec that are in desperate need of, of more resources, more population in order to sustain themselves. We need to rethink how we do immigration in this country. And we have to remember that Canada is a welcoming nation. We're a mosaic, not a melting pot. Thank you, Chad, for that. As that was the last person on that question, I will open it up for follow-ups. Does anyone have any follow-ups? Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, Anna, and then Simone, and anyone else? So we will start with Elizabeth on this. Uh, hold on, sorry, everyone. Elizabeth, 30 seconds to yourself whenever you're ready. Yeah. Just again, a quick reminder that uh, policies are derived from our membership, not from us as individual candidates. But I, I, this question touches so closely to the other side of this coin, which is global population pressures. And I've seen the po world population has more than doubled in my lifetime, which is pretty darn scary. Uh, what we need to do is be also looking at we do have good green policies around making sure that we invest in the independence well-being of women and girls around the world because that's the only proven thing that in a compassionate and respectful way reduces population pressures thank you elizabeth um i see jonathan raised his hand as well so we will get him in the rotation after simon uh anna after yourself 30 seconds whenever you are ready <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to reconnect to the question of uh, rural worker needs and uh, immigration into rural areas. One key area that we have to address in our immigration program is the temporary foreign worker program or the, the uh, migrant farm workers. Um, these are people who are present in our agricultural communities every year, year on year and yet they're not allowed to stay for the winter. They're not allowed to bring their families here. And uh, one way that we can revitalize our communities is to welcome them and their families year round, give them permanent resident status, give them the ability to contribute year after year. Thank you so much, Anna. Simone, we will head over to yourself, 30 seconds whenever you are ready. So it's for me, okay. So I want to be clear. You know, I'm for immigration, but at what level? What the liberals are planning right now is like we will be a hundred millions in 2100. So I need to repeat that because that's is going on right now. And that's urban sprawl and we're green. How could we like manage like uh, 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 the, the environment with urban sprawl that's coming and it's coming fast. We need to talk about that. And it's very important, I think. And I'll take my other 30 seconds after to finish my thought. No worries. Uh, so we will then go to Jonathan. I see Chad and then we'll go back to Simone here. So uh, Jonathan. Ben. everyone's everyone's making me do some exercise here today it's very helpful thank you uh, i've been slayed up all week so uh 30 seconds to jonathan whenever you are ready i think there's a lot of things that can be said uh on the question of population growth uh, but that is a global phenomenon not one that is strictly canadian uh, and canada's population will continue to grow we need to build the infrastructure that will allow for future generations to live well in this country. Uh, and that includes people of all backgrounds and all uh, origins uh, and ensure that these people's ability to make contributions to Canada are uh, possible. Thank you so much. We will then now go to Chad for his 30 seconds. Whenever you're ready, Chad, go ahead. Sure. I guess what I wanted to touch on is, is Green Party policy that you know Elizabeth touched on before. Currently, the Green Party policy doesn't, we don't limit immigration. We don't have a policy against expanding immigration, actually. Um, and in, in the times of conflict that we now live in, uh, it's more important than ever for Canada, with a Green-led Canada, to, to have comprehensive ways to bring people to our country, especially those who are fleeing war or civil unrest, like we're seeing in Haiti, like we're seeing in uh, Ukraine. We have to find sustainable ways to bring people here and create resilient communities rather than closing the door. 
Thank you, Chad. Simone, 30 seconds to your last 30 seconds to you whenever you're yeah. ready. So nobody is saying closing the door. It's just like instead of doing an open bar, it's just like thinking about, yes, the infrastructure, there's the limit, the pressure. Now we have housing problem. Now we have this. We need to build and to welcome them and be able to, you know, live together properly. Now it's going fast to please well entrepreneur so they can do more money. And then, oh, they say, uh, the unemployment rate is too low. Let's bring, bring that up because now it's the, the employee who have the power. Huh? They can choose the job and that's great. We need to stay like that also. I'm not saying to close anything. 300,000, that's the number, okay? And now they're going for what? For a cock fight to say, I'm the strongest Thank country with 100 so much, million Simone. population. So I'm in politics to talk about the okay. real thing and we need to talk about that. Yeah. So Thank you. we Sorry. have uh, three people with a 30 second follow up still. Uh, that is Chad, you have 30 seconds, Anna, you have 30 seconds, and Sarah, you have 30 seconds. Before we move on to closing statements, would either one of you three like to use your final closing statements or just raise your hand or, okay. So Anna, you are going to go one last time. Whenever you're ready, 30 seconds. Oh, hold okay, on. This is Two seconds. Rebuttal. Now go ahead. I just had to make sure you were on the screen. I, I, I won't use that as a rebuttal to this specific uh, last question, but there was a suggestion earlier from Elizabeth and Jonathan that uh, having Elizabeth in the house on November 20 is an essential pitch, um, which is why their leadership is so important. I will say that regardless of who wins on November 19, Elizabeth is going to be a leader in the house on November 20. And we will work with her. Um, we will elevate her voice, um, as I understand previous leaders have not done. Um, and she would be part of our leadership team. Um, it is absolutely okay to choose a leader outside the house. Many parties have done it before. And it's part of renewal. Thank you, Anna. So with that, Sarah, Chad, one follow oh, Chad's going to go one last time. Chad, 30 seconds to you. Follow up uh, whenever you're ready. Yeah, we're at a time for the Green Party of Canada that we need renewal. We also need people who have experience mobilizing and working in conflict resolution situations. Anna and I have over 25 years of experience doing that. And we look forward to working with Elizabeth as our parliamentary leader, even if she does not win the leadership. Under a leadership of uh, the Keenan Walcott uh, team, we would bring people together. We would create leaders that can create leaders because we're about planning for the future of our party. We want to ensure that we can be sustainable and our and our party can continue on in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. So the only person who has not used up all of the oh, Sarah is now waving. So we are all going to use up our rebuttal slash. So <laughs> Sarah, thirty seconds to you. Whenever you are ready. Um I hope the observers are feeling the magic the way I am. We pretty much all agree that Canada is a have country in the era of climate crisis and climate change. And that when it comes to a newcomer policy, we the Greens need to get together. And so as leader, I'm really hoping that all six of us will get together at those monthly policy table talks and help work on a climate crisis aware uh, newcomer program. And I want to um, applaud Anna for talking about a migrant worker um, uh, plan that, that we already do have a policy around that. And we also need one around accreditation. Thank you so much. So with that, that ends our segment of question and answers. Um, I want to thank you all for participating, for doing uh, what you needed to do and trying to stay on time as much as possible. We are now heading into our closing statements. They will be reverse in B they will be in reverse alphabetical orders from the opening statements. So with that, remember, they are two minutes in length. Uh, you can speak uh, English, French, however you want to use these two minutes. You can. You don't have to use the full two minutes. I'm not saying you do, but if you want to, go ahead. So we're going to start with Chad on this. Chad, two minutes to yourself. And yes, I will cut you off right at the two minute mark for this one because we are getting close here. So two minutes to yourself, Chad, whenever you're ready. Perfect. Thank you very much, Chris. So I want to use this two minutes to tell Canadians and to tell Green Party members why Anna and I are ready to be the next leaders 
of the Green Party of Canada. In fact, Anna and I have a proven track record of being able to take our ideas and put them in the practice in the service of the communities that we represent and the communities that we work in. We've been able to do that because we're able to build strong teams around us and not strong teams simply by picking brilliant people to work with us like our campaign manager, Ryan, and like all of our wonderful volunteers. No, it's by creating a culture of trust and respect within our team and applying the principles of leading from behind. We wanna set a vision together with the members of the Green Party of Canada of how we go forward and invest our time and energy in allowing our experts that we surround ourselves with to take the lead and push the party to the next level. This is how we built a career of success for ourselves. Uh, and this is what we want to bring to the Green Party of Canada. We know for a fact that there's a lot of hard work to do to rebuild the trust within our party. But we have a solid plan that we've put out to address that and to get the party back on its feet and performing better than we have in the past. Uh, you know, it's so important now more than ever that the green values take a central place in Canadian democracy and Canadian political discourse. We need to elect 12 members to parliament as soon as possible so that we can push for bold climate action, proportional representation, and start building a well-being economy. We need Greens in Parliament to start throwing our weight around so that we can force the other parties to not only steal our policies, but to put them in action. Uh, Anna and I, as I said, have the skills, experience, and know-how how to get us there. And we ask the members to put your faith in us on November 19th to push forward to a party that is renewed, to a party that has stronger foundation of democracy, inclusion, and trust. And we're asking you to put our trust, your trust in us and that we embark on a journey Thank of making history together. Thank you so much, Chad. As I said, I will cut you off right at the two minute mark for this one. Uh, next will be Jonathan. Jonathan, two minutes to yourself whenever you're ready. Our party, our country, and our planet are faced with numerous multiplied, multiplying crises. Uh, and these crises do require the experience and the stability uh, for us to not only address these issues, uh, but grow from there. Uh, I believe that Elizabeth and I, with our accumulated experience, not only in the House of Commons, but also internationally abroad, with Elizabeth leading a number of international uh, discussions and negotiations, but my own expertise and experience leading teams of journalists whose houses were uh, being burned, whose family members were being killed, to lead these teams of journalists in several conflict areas to produce accurate, objective information. And I've been doing that uh, for a very long time, as I've also uh, listened and documented abuses throughout the world. I do believe that Canadian politics requires strong listening. I, I think this party also requires strong listeners, uh, people who are able to go around the country and meet as many Greens as possible, as Elizabeth and I have been doing in four provinces uh, since the beginning of this race. Uh, we do require the stability uh, to grow further and to grow forward. Um, our party right now is experiencing uh, a financial crisis. We need to bring in money as soon as possible so that we can hire good staff, have the, the infrastructure in place uh, to grow from uh, where we are currently because the world isn't waiting after us. The world won't wait. We have an emergency. It is the crisis emergency. It requires strong leadership, uh, not tomorrow, not in 10 years from now, yesterday and as soon as November 20th and Elizabeth and I will provide that to the Green Party. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Elizabeth, two minutes to yourself whenever you're ready. Thanks. I'm glad the way the luck of the draw worked out here, Christopher, I get to follow Jonathan because I'm extremely honored and excited about the possibilities that the two of us as a team offer to the Green Party of Canada. He's an extraordinary young man uh, with a lot of experience in places that I'd be terrified to go, honestly. But to the question of proven, proven track record, what was I doing with my life before I was leader of the Green Party? Grassroots organizing everywhere across the country through the Sierra Club of Canada. And before that, grassroots organizing in Cape Breton to stop toxic insecticide spraying. Lost our land fighting Agent Orange against the, the forest industry of Nova Scotia back in the 80s. 
I have always been someone who's been in struggle to try to make the world a better place. I don't believe that uh, I'm the only option or that Jonathan and I are the only option that if you don't have somebody who's a leader in parliament, the party doesn't move forward. But let's just be clear. Right now, the Canadian public looks at us and they don't know who we are. They don't know if they can trust us. The fastest way to restore this party is to trust in Jonathan and me as a team, moving this party to co-leadership. That's only one of the structural questions we need to address. We need to address how come we have so many entities within the party who are somewhat siloed, council or fund or EDAs that don't get a seat at the table, our Indigenous People's Advisory Circle. There are lots of elements of this party that need to come together because we're stronger when we work together as teams. I know that we will get most of us here in this room elected to Parliament for sure. But the chances of getting Anna Keenan in Parliament are far better if I'm MP and leader in the House and she concentrates on her riding. We will work together as a team no matter what. And I ask the members of this party to please trust Thank in you Johnson Pedro so and me. Much, Thank you. Elizabeth. Anna, you have two minutes for your closing statements. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm, I'm going to respectfully disagree with uh, with uh, our strategy, but I uh, the strategy of what will uh, result in most Greens getting elected. Um, but I want to point out that Chad and I have also been around the party for a long time. We've been CEOs or communications uh, officers in our district associations. Both of us have run before. We have electoral experience. I have significant international experience in many of the same uh, networks as, as Elizabeth does throughout the climate movement, um, working in international roles for international organizations. I first met Elizabeth, in fact, 15 years ago at the United Nations Climate Talks, where I also met my lovely Canadian husband, uh, which brought me to PEI. Um, we have experience lobbying and working with and communicating diplomatically with government representatives. Uh, we've also been traveling uh, as part of this leadership race. We've been to five provinces so far. We also have experience doing significant fundraising work, which is what we need. Our party is uh, really in the financial doldrums right now. We also have experience work in governance. We've been presidents or board members or advisors or consultants to multiple nonprofit organizations. We know how to work respectfully and collaboratively with the operations side of the party in our executive director and staff and with the governance side of the party in uh, president, council and the fund. We have a radical vision for where we want to go and we also have a plan that takes tangible steps to get there. We can make progress in the short term that leads us in the long term to the radical transformation of society that is the green vision for Canada. We're running on a co-leadership platform. We've been working together really collaboratively since February. We are equal partners and genuine partners in this co-leadership relationship. We're both on the ballot separately and we're encouraging members to rank us as number one and two on your ballots in whichever order you prefer. We want to advance the well-being economy, bring in proportional representation and ambitious climate action. Please check out our website. Take Thank care. Thank you so much, Anna. Now we'll go to Simone. Simone, your two minutes closing statement starts whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chris. So I'm in politics to talk about the real thing. I think you saw it. I will talk about what I think is a problem and that to be solved or discussed and see the opinion of everybody. That being said, if the group want to go in a direction, I will follow and I will go also in that direction. And I will manage and I will work with them and I will do the things that we decide that should be done. Uh, I brought during the immigration question, uh, the century uh, plan. I think that thing needs to be studied. It's very, very important. Uh, for example, Finland grew from 20% in demography since 1960. Canada doubles. We're going to uh, 100 million in 2100. That means we triple from what we are right now. Uh, I'm not saying let's abandon the world. No, no, no. We need a strong foreign policy. We need to go out there and, yes, help structure, make poverty go away everywhere on the planet. But if we go too fast here and we do things too fast, we will create poverty. And some people will get very rich and some people will get very poor. 
that's not the kind of world I want to build. So I think inside the party, I'm able to bring, you know, real talk. I'm able to, you know, talk about whatever is necessary to talk about, solve problem, go forward, engage with people, connect with people. That's what I do. And I think that I could be a great leader that will manage and work with all the members and all the, the, the other also like uh, contendent here. Uh, I think they have something to bring and it will be uh, uh, very important to make sure that that's been used for the great of the party. Thank you so much. And then our last closing statement is Sarah. Sarah, two minutes to yourself whenever you're ready. There's a real tension between the idea of a grassroots political party and playing the game by the game's rules, a hierarchical. So what does grassroots look like? It looks like a member who's in, been involved in, um, you can see on my, on my platform that I put Indigenous Crown Relations first. Again, we're having a debate where we haven't talked about Crown Indigenous Relations and Truth Before Reconciliation and Solidarity with Indigenous Nations. I was the member of the Constitutional Working Group for a year and a half, where we helped make sure sure that we had a general meeting. Um, uh, the Indigenous People's Advisory Circle can be a place where we where we help, hopefully they will help us evolve towards restorative justice um, ways of dealing with intermember conflict. We need to increase our social media game. Uh, and so, so when Elizabeth and our, our caucus have, have we need to have programs and national campaigns, hashtag campaigns supporting them. One of my promises to Greens is that within five years, we will have Greens on campus at every college and university right across the country. We need to evolve this party into a youth led party. We have action teams. Um, that, is a, that is an internal, a lot of members don't know about it, but it is a place where volunteers can um, help us internally because we do have a shortage of staff. Um, uh, one of the most important places where we have fun as members is at that ground level, at the Electoral District Association level. And we have had EDA revitalization 2021 that I was involved in. Now we have EDA empowerment 2022 that I was taking a lead role in before I had to join the race and step back. I am listening to members. One thing they asked us to do is one page policy um, delivery of messaging before an election. That that's in my platform. Please go to my platform and go to the second half, Inward Strength. And there are many ideas that I've developed over Thank the past 17 so years. Thank you so much, Sarah. That is our closing statements. And I want to take a moment and thank every single one of you who sat down with us tonight and take took time out of your busy uh, campaign to answer some of the questions that were important to your members. As I said, we had over 300 uh, submissions from across this great country. You have a very diverse population, very diverse membership who is engaged, and I'm very proud of that. I want to remind everyone that voting for the next leader of the Green Party of Canada begins on November 12th, according to the Green Party website, and will end on November 19th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the new leader chosen and announced later that day. I also want to take a moment and say if you live in the provinces of Ontario and Quebec, tomorrow is uh, this week is election week for you municipally. You'll be electing mayors, councillors and school boards. So get out and vote, 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 vote. And also a shameless plug. And this one might choke me up a little bit. So I do apologize right now if I can't get through it. Um, Monday, October 24th is Brain Cancer Awareness Day in Canada. It is the fifth day that we sell. Well, we don't celebrate. We. <sighs> We bring awareness to brain cancer patients as someone who has been battling one for the last two and a half years. I can tell you that there is hope. Our medical system is not the best, but there are people out there who are in worse condition. So please take a moment tomorrow and think of the people who are going through treatments right now, who are struggling and who are dealing with their day to day lives. Um, and I want to thank you, the candidates and their representatives for helping put this debate on tonight. Uh, and I want to also take a quick moment and thank everyone who's watched, who's listened, who's going to listen to this later on. 
Um, thank you for being engaged and being part of this leadership debate. And thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to watch. Who wouldn't want to enjoy a Sunday night watching six people talk about issues that are important to you? I know I did, and that's why I wanted to help put this on. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your Twitter, your Facebook, your TikTok, and go to have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, it helps our society, and at the end of the day, it helps us be a better people. I also want to remind you, if you're watching this right now or at a later date, the links to all these candidates' social media, as I just told you to get off social media, are in the show notes. So go check them out. Go learn a little bit more about them. Reach out to them. Ask your questions. I wish I could have spent a whole day asking 300 questions to these candidates, but it is impossible. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown's live Green Party of Canada leadership debate. Have a wonderful day, and remember everyone, just keep talking. Thank you.